next. Okay, he joined. Okay, uh, John. Well, All right, awesome. So my presentation is on using dynamic pointers in BPF XDP programs. So uh, just a bit of background information. Uh, my name is Joanne. Um, I recently, I work at Meta and I recently joined the kernel team about, uh, about a year ago. And so on the Linux kernel team at Meta, I work on BPF and networking. Um, so yeah, so dynamic pointers are kind of a recent introduction to BPF. Um, it was introduced in a patch set I think uh, earlier this year. And essentially what it does is it provides a way for BPF programs to verify that memory accesses that are dynamic, so that are not statically known at compile time, uh, can be verified safely in a way that the program can uh, be executed uh, by the verifier and ensured that it's actually going to do what it's supposed to do and doesn't access any memory out of bounds or lead to any... Uh, Can you... Uh, you should get an email with request access uh, to my second slides. email. Can you display our slides? Uh, I... She's sending me them. Oh, yeah. Did you receive anything? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, finally. Uh... Awesome, cool, thanks. So yeah, so uh, this is kind of just a, going to be a brief introduction to um, how you use thin pointers in XDP programs and why it's relevant um, to these programs. Alex, I think you have to navigate the slides because I don't think I'm able to do it from here. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, so um, if you're interested in the patch set that kind of lays the foundations of dynamic pointers in BPF. Uh, there's a link at the bottom that you can look at. Um, and so dynamic pointers are kind of a way for um, BPF programs to interact with data dynamically, uh, hence the name. And there's a um, LWN article that David Burnett recently wrote that kind of gives a brief introduction to dynamic pointers. So that's also a good resource if you're <clears throat> looking for some more information. So yeah, so you might be wondering, how does this relate to XDP at all? So recently a patch was pushed out that introduces uh, dynamic pointers for SKB and XDP programs. Um, so the way uh, that kind of works is the dynamic pointer is kind of uh, essentially a pointer that contains extra information alongside it. So I think in other languages, it's often referred to as a fat pointer or a smart pointer. So um, in this, the underlying pointer points to the XDP buff um, and any accesses on that DIN pointer uh, works directly with the XDP data. Um, there'll be some more examples in a bit that kind of illustrate how exactly this does this. But for now, um, essentially there are three main benefits to using dynamic pointers in your XDP program. So the first kind of goes in line with the concept of dynamic pointers, which is it allows operations on sizes that are not known at compile time. Um, and so this poses a problem for the uh, BPF programs in general because the verifier needs to 
know at low time whether the program is safe or not. And so if the um, memory access you're trying to do is of a dynamic size, uh, that becomes very hard to ascertain as to whether that should be permitted or not. Um, so in particular with XTP programs, uh, that goes with accessing at variable size offsets where uh, that is uh, not known at compile time. Uh, the second one is using DIN pointers for parsing your packet data um, is often a lot more ergonomic and less brittle. So right now, without DIN pointers, um, there's a lot of if checking to make sure that any memory you access has to be within the XCP data end. Um, and so with DIN pointers, this kind of provides an interface where you just need to construct a DIN pointer from your uh, from your memory, and you can just use that throughout the lifetime of the program. Um, another thing also is that uh, often uh, there might be some changes in LLVM, like compiler optimizations, that can sometimes cause the verifier to reject a previously safe program that it previously determined to be safe through the if-bounds checking. So with DIN pointers, this kind of circumvents that, where <clears throat> there's now a way to always ensure that your program is going to be uh, correctly accepted by the verifier. And the last point is um, this kind of also provides interface for more easier interaction with fragments. Um, so instead, like if you have a case where you don't know if your offset is within a fragment or not, then pointers kind of provide a one-way interface to, uh, to kind of read or write data uh, without needing to actually know if it's in your uh, fragment or not. Yeah. Okay, so the main APIs, uh, there are four of them. Uh, the first one is how you construct a DIN pointer for your uh, XDP data. So um, it's pretty straightforward. The first one is uh, the first argument you just passed in your uh, context argument. Your second flags is zero. It's currently unused. Uh, Pointer is the pointer you get back after constructing it. Um, oh. And yeah, feel free to stop me if you guys have any questions um, at any point. Uh, next API is kind of how you get a direct slice to your XDP data. Um, so that's just BPF in pointer data. Um, also, these APIs, except for the first one, kind of work on uh, all thin pointer types. So besides the XDP and SKP data, there's also thin pointers to local data. There'll be uh, added thin pointers to uh, dynamically allocated memory, like malloc. Um, but for now, yeah, so you can also use these for XDP. Yeah, so uh, the second API returns a data slice. Uh, access to it is guarded by the verifier. So if you try to go out of the bounds of your data slice, your program will be rejected. Um, and so this supports direct access to data in fragments, but not across fragments. So if your offset is to a specific piece of memory that resides within one fragment, this will essentially give you uh, direct access to that fragment where you're able to do direct reads and writes um, up to the length that you specified in that API. Um, and something to note here too is that length is not dynamic. It has to be a static size. and that's so the verifier can know at load time whether any accesses out of bounds or um, can be rejected or not, but offset can be dynamic here. And so the next two APIs are pretty straightforward. Uh, it's reading uh, data from a DIN pointer and writing data into the DIN pointer. And these support writing to and across fragments. So if your data um, kind of overlaps uh, multiple fragments, um, that is acceptable, as well as uh, data that's in the head that goes into a fragment. Okay, so without dynamic pointers, um, programs like these get rejected. So this is traditionally how you um, would try to do something that accesses uh, a dynamic offset with, uh, in an XTP program right now. So here, as you can see, uh, you get a pointer to the XTP data XDP data end, and your offset, uh, if that's a dynamic value and you're trying to um, construct a pointer to data plus offset, um, that will also be 
considered dynamically unknown uh, by the verifier at load time. And so whenever you tried to access that uh, offset, um, essentially the verifier will reject that as um, a offset is outside of the packet. So you can see that kind of um, near the bottom. I don't know if you guys can read that, but um, kind of near the bottom, the offset is outside of the packet. So this program is not possible to be run by the uh, currently in the BPF program. So with thin pointers, um, kind of the way around this is you would use uh, kind of the thin pointer APIs to first construct the thin pointer for the XDP context variable that you're passed in. Um, and then you can get a data slice to this thin pointer using BPF thin pointer data. Um, that will give you back a pointer to the direct slice or null if that pointer uh, wasn't able to be constructed. And so uh, you always need to check whether that pointer is actually null or not. Um, and yeah, if it turns out it's not null, you can directly access that memory by either reading or writing to it. And so, um, yeah, so this is kind of how you would use uh, dynamic pointers to access something at an offset that is not known at compile time. So yeah, so this is um, another example, this time using thin pointer read and write. So read and write is for access across fragments. If you don't really know whether your data uh, straddles different fragments or not, um, but essentially it does the same thing as what you can do with BPF thin pointer uh, with the data slice, which is being able to read or write to it. Um, so with here, you construct your DIN pointer. And then um, once you have your DIN pointer, you're able to kind of read and write at whatever offset, dynamic or not, and length that you wish to. Yeah, and that's kind of the conclusion of this introduction to uh, DIN pointers and XDP programs. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Awesome. I have. Okay. Uh, I see the name. Uh, I saw dynamic pointers uh, for functions to take either SKB or XDP buff. Yeah. So can you tell? A yeah. couple words. Yeah. So because I'm interested in that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, there is also a BPF DIN pointer from SKB API, um, where you're able to construct a DIN pointer for your XDP data. Um, so that kind of works essentially the same way as the XDP one does, but there are a few differences. So um, one, I believe, is like uh, if you do a write, um, if that data is in a uh, in a buffer, um, so it's not within the head then that invalidates any data slices that you might previously have had because the packet data might have changed. Um, so there are a few caveats there, but um, essentially the premise is the same. You're able to kind of use that as an interface for interacting with your packet data more dynamically and more ergonomically um, and reading and writing to um, your uh, data that might be in the buffers as well. Thanks. 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 Does it require any driver support? No. Uh, how does it work also with head uh, buffer? Uh, do you mean like how does it work uh, within the verifier or? So you have uh, like the SPDF helpers to expand the packet. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, uh, say, use the mic so that, because there's remote people. Do oh. you have another mic? It's only my so uh, this uh, this PPF helper where you can expand the packet or add headers in front of the packet. So how it, does it work with the dynamic pointer? Yeah. Uh, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, it's that uh, the packet may be expanded or contracted. Yeah. So how does that work? Yeah. So when the packet is uh, expanded or contracted, I believe there's already BPF helpers that can do this. Um, so whenever that is called, uh, that first of all, um, if you have any direct data slices to that data, that's automatically invalidated by the verifier. 
So any previous data slices have to be reconstructed um, with the DIN pointer. And so when you reconstruct it with a DIN pointer, um, that reflects essentially the data that was added or contracted because the DIN pointer underneath the hood is kind of just a wrapper for your a pointer to the SKP buff itself. And so the SKP buff itself is modified. So when that's modified, that's automatically reflected in a DIN pointer. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Does it require more? No, I don't think so. So I, I have a question from the bridge. It's, it's Machi. Hi. So I'm like, um, I must admit, I wasn't like following closely what was going on regarding this stuff on the mailing list. So could you like remind us, um, because I believe that you have like broken this down to a particular steps in terms of upstreaming, right? Mm -hmm. So can you like um, remind us where you're at right now and what is left to be upstreamed and whatsoever? I mean, what's like the current status in the upstream? Yeah, um, so right now, um, this is the second patch set of the DIN pointer series. And this is the one that adds the SKP and XDP access. Um, yeah. With that right now, um, I think that was pushed out in July. Uh, right now, I think it's on like, um, it's being reviewed. Um, yeah, I took uh, kind of a month hiatus. So I've kind of been inactive on that, but I'm back now and trying to get that upstreamed. Um, so yeah, so I think it's being reviewed right now. Um, there's been a lot of good feedback on it, especially with making the APIs a lot more um, user-friendly, a lot less uh, annoying for users with little things they have to watch out for. Um, after this, I plan to add uh, DIN pointers for dynamic memory allocations. Um, and persisting them across maps. So I think after that piece is added, um, the DIM pointer series is um, complete from what I was trying to uh, set out to do. OK, thank you. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Good, thanks. Maciej, will you go next with, uh, let me just open this again. Can we clap on the bridge somehow? I believe not. Yes, you're <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I can go with, you know. Okay, uh, go then. So we, we didn't uh, reach out successfully to Juo, um, I mean, for the yeah. AFXDP for Virtaio. Uh, I reached out he, to him and he said he has bad English and he won't say anything. Despite that he's accepted my meeting and said, yeah, sure, I will present. Uh, so, I mean, maybe we'll go with AFXDP uh, multi buffer. Yeah. But, um, so, you, you'll be sharing the slides for me? Sure. Yeah, and um, I wait until uh, I see this on the bridge. Yeah, no, one sec. Yeah, one sec. Okay, I see this on the bridge. So I believe that everyone else also do. So um, uh, I have like few slides to, you know, um, trigger a discussion about supporting the multi-buffer in the AFXDP core um, and um, probably therefore to support also Jumbo frames, which has been brought up many times on the mailing list from various people um but um yeah so from like um intel perspective we've been working um mostly uh, right now for supporting the multi-buffer on the standard um, driver on the xdp datapad 
in a way that um, we don't introduce huge like you know performance um, penalty um, because um, what I from what I saw um, the the drivers that were like you know um, adding the multi buffer support I didn't see any info about how this affect the you know performance for non multi buffer case um, and um, uh, so I don't know whether it was like you know there was no penalty or, or whatsoever and um, basically we came up with some with, with some solutions so it's um, um, you know right time to go and think about how to do this on the like AFXDP side so um, can you go with the next slide please so um, I will you know stick to the uh, like discussing the rx side um because the tx site is rather trivial um to like you know implement and um it's mostly because we don't have the xdp program running in this um site so at the bottom of the slide you see the layout of the afxdp descriptor um so um basically we have a field called options which um we will utilize for like you know um, uh, pushing the um, back and forth the, the information about whether the particular descriptor is like the last descriptor of the frame or not right so we will be signaling the like um, end of packet bits um, from the hardware and to the hardware between the you know user space and the like uh, driver um, so uh generally for um standard um xdp um multi buffer support within the drivers it's like um we have to like gather the the, the frame that occupies the multiple hardware descriptors onto the like xdp buff right so basically you get the xdp buff uh, that that represents your whole frame it consists of the linear and the you know frax part the frax part is uh like you know th it, this is the we reuse the skb shared info to you know to carry on with the fragments right um so um then this is the i mean the, the reason for doing so is that um uh, when we support the multi-buffer um on the like xdp um we have to get the whole frame before we run, we run the xdp program like against the xdp buff right because um we might be using the um, bpf helpers that are like um, um would walk through the um, whole xdp buff the linear and the fragments part in order to get the length of the of, of the whole frame whatsoever right so um what does it mean for the afxdp is that um, um like performance wise it won't be um like you know fast because if you see on this like diagram um at first we will be the, like gathering the um whole frame from the descriptors to the xdp buff and then later on we don't have the mechanism to like you know push the whole like frame represented via the xdp buff up to the afx dprx ring we basically would have to scatter the frame again um so the question that i'm trying to like answer and you know to trigger the discussion right now is how do we address that and i have like you know i listed two um possible solutions maybe not the solutions, but, you know, some options, right? So um, if we go to the next slide, uh, like the, you know, the, the, the first um, option is to like um, special case the XDP redirect inside the, you know, zero copy drivers, um, because we, we tend to do so right now. I mean, we are likely finding the verdict from the um, XDP program within the zero copy drivers, because it's like the most, like common case um so maybe we could piggyback on that and um, um you know basically build the xdp buff 
per single hardware descriptor, even if it's like the fragment, uh, and then, you know, um, push it uh, up to the AFX DP RX ring state. And I just realized that I didn't like say the most important thing is that um, we, for like, for AFX DP, we would like to push the like combining of the um, like uh, whole frame from like, you know, being it scattered from the like RX ring up to the user space. So such solution would um, give us like this um, possibility to, you know, basically um, like push what we get from the um, hardware RX ring up to the AFX DP RX ring, and then the user space would be combining the whole frame. But um, this basically means that we would like violate the, you know, the, the like you could attach the XDP program that is relying on the multi buffer support or, you know, use some BPF helpers specific to that. And then this would probably be, be broken. So the question is whether we could like, I don't know, forbid these helpers for AFXDP, or we could like um, go further and go with the option two, um, which is on the another slide. So basically this would mean that um, uh, there was some work from Sridhar previously um, where we were like, you know, having the dummy program, um, which allowed us for a um, like AFXDP direct receive. So basically, um, uh, the driver was responsible for producing the AFXDP RX descriptors, not the like redirect mechanism, right? So, but this is like, um, the, this received a huge pushback from the community. I believe that the most part was like due to the fact that it was like measured incorrectly. How, how does it affect the performance? Um, but, um, and I don't, I know that, you know, people don't like the idea of removing the XDP program from AFXDP data path, but it's like the, like another um, um, situation where it gets like, it, it gives us problems. So um, basically um, that's what we're like, you know, trying to um, find the solution at um, the, you know, supporting multi-buffer for AFXDP um so uh n the next stuff is um about you know having the jumbo frame support and there's like the, the the first bullet on the slide refers to what people were um mostly um like referring to um you know how to support that um so they were like you know um their like knee jerk reaction was to do the Alan light mode with huge pages and like, you know, leave the, the restriction of the chunk size from like 4k to, you know, something bigger, like, I don't, maybe just 9k would be like sufficient. And, um, then, uh, there is a chance that this would work. Right. But, um, is it the desirable like solution for us? I mean, probably uh, something that we would like to end up eventually is a aligned mode without like forcing user to configure the huge pages, right? Um, so the, the case is that this would, um, um, we, we would have to f find some mechanism to like, you know, retrieve the contiguous memory um, in terms of like, you know, physical memory from, uh, um the dm map system call right that 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 is used to configure the umem in the user space which is then you know shared with the kernel um so this is like something else to you know to to um like you know find out and um um there was uh one thing that i would like to also touch on is that um someone on the mailing list like like mentioned once that you know having the proper jumbo frame support within the afxdp would uh, make the multi-buffer support redundant and um so this might be true but um 
like um, for copy mode, this would mean that we would ha be, have to be like grabbing the order three pages for like, you know, having the Jumbo frame support for um, um, copy mode AFX DP drivers, um, which like, uh, I believe that, you know, back in the days, either Jesper or Alexander Dyke were like, you know, having the presentations that were showing that that the higher the order of the page um, we get from the kernel, the, the, the less effective it might get, right? So, um, w w w like from my perspective, the, the way forward is to um, have a, um, you know, um, like zero copy can support like the true, uh, like jumbo frames that would occupy a single hardware descriptor. And for copy mode, I would stick with a, you know, the multi buffer support that, uh, like, you know, standard XDP paths uh, are getting, right? So basically, we would scatter the um, jumbo frames. And um, I hope to get some discussion around those topics that I raised. So that's it from my side. So uh, when you say jumbo frames, do you mean uh, like uh, huge pages type of thing? No, it's like um, just, you know, nine. You, you said 9K MTU and you want to have the, you know, AFX DP run against the underlying networking driver, right? Yeah, but even if jumbo frames are enabled and you have 9K MTU, that doesn't mean that the buffer will be... Uh, uh, contiguous, going to be fragmented, anyways. Like, like, uh, like, if you get like uh, the the uh, like, you're saying that uh, that the human would consist of multiple huge pages, right? Multiple regular pages of four uh, K size, four K. Yeah, frame. and uh, yeah, and that's what I, I, but that's what I, you know, um, like trying to find out if there is like possible mechanism or, or solution to, you know, uh, get a, you know, pages continuous in the, like, you know, physical memory. No, right? uh, simple answer is no, it's not reliable. Yeah. So what you're, what you're saying is that without huge pages, we won't be able to support the jumbo frames in the AFXDP. Uh, yeah, you'll have to, we, we need the multi buffer support. Okay. Yeah, but if that's uh, like it's depending on the architecture, most architectures today have 44 k pages, and drivers are only allowed to allocate uh, like single pages or yeah. order zero pages. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but for for zero copy, it's like the memory comes from the user space, right? So yeah. Um, if if you would like, you know, go with the huge pages and an aligned mode and that you would like configure the chunk size to the 9k then you would be able probably to like feed the driver with a contiguous 9k memory of you know um that, yeah, that, that would help if you can make sure that the application will have access to huge pages and it uh, going to be guaranteed that it will get the, the, these pages yeah yeah because from my experience uh, on a fragmented system you're not gonna have you know contiguous pages Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's like, um, you know, the, this this topic has been brought up on the list various times. So it's like high time probably to start discussing it. No, all I was saying is that at some point, even two meg, you're going to cross. So you basically have to do it multi-buffer and segment the, the 9K as three different fragments. That's the most robust way to do it. Mm-hmm. He's saying that an AFXDP. So an AFXDP, the buffers are coming from the user space. There's an option yeah. to use huge pages in this case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you if you are like configuring the unaligned mode currently, because AFXDP works in those two like you know um, ways, right? The unaligned mode is basically working on either um, 
2K chunks of, of like frames or 4K chunks, right? And you know that, you know, every single like frame within the like UMEM, which represents your whole like, you know, buffer space for like AFXDP ap application, um, th then you know that, uh, you know the, the size of each of the frame, right? And for unaligned mode, um, like basically DPDK folks developed this for, you know, for their like purposes. But, you know, once we got this onto the kernel, then we have to support this. They are configuring the huge pages and there um, each chunk can be like of a variable um, like length, right? So currently we have something like, you know, usage of the huge pages for the AFXDP. So um, the, the question is whether we can correctly lift this up in order to, you know, support the Jumbo frames. Yeah, okay. I think if you pass this information to the driver and uh, then it, I think it's possible. Yeah, so basically we will be like taking this on the, our plates currently, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay, Matthew, probably we'll close the topic then. Yeah, thank you. Um, for our discussion, will be over the mailing list. Thanks. Okay, then let's move with XDP hints, and here's our small sub-agenda for them. And uh, uh, yeah, let me start with that. We now have two different patch series, one from me and the other one from Jesper. And uh, many people ask me why there are two different series. Why not like communicate and make one of them and uh, just one? like combined and uh, yeah first of all they are um, implementing pretty much the same thing but in sort of different ways and there are a couple of questions that are uh, that we are like don't agree on and uh, for now we don't see like a common solution uh, anyway uh, let's go through some questions and I expect like people to also discuss stuff uh, first of all, why do we need generic, uh, some sort of a structure or anything? Why not just use some custom, like vendor specific, for example, or just copy the whole descriptor to the metadata? Uh, and here I have some examples. Uh, first two, they are coming from the kernel, not from the user space programs. Uh, it's Viv and CPU map because they are lying on the in the kernel and uh, you basically can't like patch them like you do for BPF programs in JIT. And uh, so you can use hints on them uh, on Viv and CPU map only by some generic structure that are compile time known uh, at, at kernel com compilation time, not at uh, anything else. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and uh, uh, from the some feedback provided to my patch series, I see that CPU map isn't that widely used now, and uh, I yeah I realized why probably because um, like it's pretty much done for now in hardware mostly and stuff, but Wif is commonly used and. Um, Hints may be uh, sorry useful for it, uh, especially given that it uses GRO and uh, um, GRO with hints with checksum and RSS hash is like way faster than without that. And uh, uh, yeah, source independent programs and uh, let's say user space programs, AFXDP programs you can for sure uh, patch like BPF program in the real time while jitting uh, via Cori, compile answer and everywhere. It's like common way, but you can just patch user space program in the real time. I know that uh, Alexi probably wrote to me or no, not to me, 
to someone once that uh, you can just, you know, propose patch series uh, to LLVM to patch user space programs in like runtime, but it's like another topic. Um, yeah, and some couple words about Hints Handling Driver. Uh, we have two different approaches and uh, for now both series uses uh, the first one. Uh, I call it all or nothing. It means that if you enable metadata or hints uh, for like some driver interface, then it will um, provide you uh, with the meta structure with everything that it may extract from the descriptor. It means checksum, it means hashes, it means uh, whatever, VLAN ID. And the other one, I call it the false letter. Um, it means that you can configure, uh, like for example, send a bitmap from the user space on configuration time and say, hey, I want just RSS hash. Or, or hey, I want just uh, checksum, timestamp, uh, because, and uh, then you will have, for example, access only one field in the descriptor to extract, for example, timestamp and not do anything else, go through the like big descriptor, for example. And it's like an open question. It, it's, uh, kind of shared between two different questions. Uh, I'll go back to it a bit later. Um, yeah, how to configure hints, uh, because we also have different approaches in the series. Um, one is to use it at uh, users uh, BPF program uh, attach time. Uh, you just uh, with uh, when the BPF XDP attach, you just uh, pass additional like parameter that you need meta or some. Uh, for example, if we go with the second with default other, you pass a bitmap of the fields that you want to see. Um, yeah, so. Um, and the. Uh, the, another question coming from that is uh, how do you want to see like hints? For example, enable it uh, like interface wide, like it's uh, like Jesper does it. For example, he configured it from with tool. Like okay, I just want to enable it, and it's um, enabled for the interface. Or you want to have it, for example, per program, per attachment, per I don't know. Uh, it can be per uh, context, and uh, we had a topic for that, like per queue, per con context, XDP programs. Maybe I'll get back to it a bit at the end. Um, so yeah, uh, another one is maybe uh, that XDP programs should also somehow declare what fields should it use. Uh, so we can could optimize it uh, a bit at, for example, JIT time. Um, uh, Larissa, will you go with that? Okay. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, good. So another question, like and a difference between like our two approaches is like, do we want to expose some hints structures through the user API or should we like just hide all the hints in the kernel and let users access it through BTF. And like with user API, like it's like very straightforward. You just like include the header. It's simple both in like BPF program and in FFXDP program. Um, and like the obvious problem is that uh, user API is generally hard to change uh, but it's uh, it's really possible to extend like the hint structure to the top without like breaking the existing programs um, so and like yep. the next approach is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. to hide. No, okay. The next approach is to like hide all the hints uh, in in the kernel and access them through BTF. And obviously, it's not like a problem for BPF programs like at all because 
um, like you know, because of all the reallocations that happen, like PPF programs are really flexible in that. But um, but like obviously AFXDP would suffer because it would need to access hints on variable offsets. Uh, like the speed penalty would be tolerable for most users, but maybe not for all. Um, but obviously, like hiding all the hints in kernel, it has the advantage of um, of letting us like change those structures like freely anytime we want. Um, uh, so. Uh, but like with those, the, with this like FXDP uh, penalty, maybe we could like work out something for like power users that do not want to access with variable offsets. Uh, so Alex, could you please go to the next slide? Uh, okay. Uh, so, sorry, yeah, uh, yes? we have uh in the schedule we have a break right now so for a uh, 30 minutes so we'll do a like break point here and uh go back in 30 minutes i guess okay oh okay so i think it's still less light right uh, I mean, regarding no, video. it's we also have like k functions for hints. Yeah, but this one ah, is generating. Yeah, so. Come back. Yeah, yeah, let's come back in thirty minutes. Yes.
read C code, which like checks that everything is within the packet. This variable offset is within the packet. LVM generates like uh, bad L uh, yeah. UVF code from the C code. Yeah. But when you write that in a sampler, like it's like code the same code. It generates correctly, yeah sure. Why not? <laughs> Enjoy. I really think it's also hard to like even when writing in your personal song, like understanding what the verifier is saying about and why it's about it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Make sure you stay. I'm doing a website instead of like Oh, I think they'll probably do it.
Yes. 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 Yeah, we, we are doing the same. I mean, uh, like I said, they are working on the my team, uh, we are three, my team and uh, my, my colleagues. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Janos, uh, who is uh, the chairman of the world uh, DSMP. Uh, yes, yes, he is. He is. They're working together with Janos. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's not holding because of anything like that. I just, uh, uh, we are just working on the standard. He is supposed to work on standardization, organizing the standardization. Yeah, and uh, there are uh, also Polaris, 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 Yeah, he goes to do the same stuff at the end. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah,
we think that then it's a drop, so it doesn't have the IKEA number. It's a, uh, it's a drop. And it's even has its same as version, it doesn't publish yet. It's just being inside. So just imagine uh, when you migrate uh, in the cloud, you, you migrate the PSM function. Uh, Migrate and grab and migrate the packet order function. Oh, <laughs> it's really hard to handle the system and smart because you know you have it all uh, version. You, you have the migrating version and at some point you have to switch between them. And there are the ordering, but there are two types of the ordering because you, you, you have to handle the request number space of the old uh, for it's about old function and the, the new function which is the replica and uh, it's it's really painful. Yes, yes, you have to Yes. Yes. And in that, that case, you have two buffers, or you can configure how many buffers or in practice, you have to configure Yes. Okay. Should we have to do this? In Linux, you have the HSR. You know, that was the most No, it's a different number, right? It's, it's, it's a different number. That's not the tempo guy. Right? That's not the tempo guy. That's not the tempo guy. That's not the tempo guy. Yeah, but it's part of the. I didn't know about that. I did the third time. This <clears throat> okay, two espressos on my life. Um, yeah, Larissa, let's go yes. for okay. with the um, okay, so as I okay, uh, like my microphone glitched just now. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before the break, uh, there um, if we hide all the hints structures inside of um, kernel. We can access them only through VTF. 
which is great for PPF programs, but not that great for user space programs, like namely for FXDP. So, like, how can we like improve uh, maybe FXDP experience like uh, a little bit, like especially like with like by not adding uh, uh, like additional time pr uh, processing time to the packet. Um, so this is just a suggestion that we've came up with when preparing the XDP workshop, but maybe it's like worth uh, <coughs> discussing. Um, like from what I know, generating headers was some idea when um, the hints were in their infancy, um, basically. So, um, but like back then, uh, BTF wasn't yet brought into the discussion. And um, I think BTF really makes this approach easier and more useful. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what's the concept? Uh, the concept is to generate a header file from a kernel BTF, like the way we generate a VM Linux header, um, but not with like certain BTF object, but only with a hints structure and its dependencies. Um, Hint structure shouldn't have a lot of dependencies that are not already in the uh, user API, so uh, that shouldn't be like shouldn't be a huge header file. And also, what we should generate in that header file is a function. Here you can see like uh, hints verify, which will um, which basically is a function that you would need to call at the beginning of the uh, of the of your FXDP program, and what it will do is check uh, if the types your program was compiled with is compatible with types that. Um, are in the current kernel, and we can access those uh, like updated types through BTF. So, if the types changed in a way that your program becomes no longer valid, like this function will just fail, and like in that case, you will need like to uh, recompile uh, your program with like newly generated headers. Now, this is totally open to debate. As I uh, said, it's like rather a fresh idea. Um, so like, uh, okay, so that's all with this like um, hints generation. Uh, with header generation, so maybe we can go to the next slide. Yeah, any comments? <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so maybe after like after his section, there will will be more, more general questions. Okay. So um, the next topic that honestly we haven't researched too much yet, unfortunately, but I see on the mailing list that people uh, are very interested in that and that we would be not fair not to address it um, in the presentation. Uh, but like, again, as I said, this is not well researched, so if you would like to like discuss it, feel free like during the workshop. Um, so, okay, uh, 
this is like the idea of accessing the metadata through K functions and VPF helpers. So um, this like current hint state, both ours and Jasper's submission, it relies on driver putting like metadata into well xdp uh, this data meta section um, so that later xdp program can access it from this data meta and so uh, you can uh, but yeah surely that are uh, like problems that we have like ne need to have uh, um, a layout that we all that all the parts agree on, like driver and XDP program. So and then driver needs to fill in all those fields. Um, and uh, this layout that we all agree on that must be like good enough for most users. So there are many like design complications with that and also like speed penalty because we have like huge structure and it will even if we not, do not fill in uh, all the metadata will still have to like fill in flags and that kind of stuff so um, with those helpers it like takes a different approach and we want uh, to let, like, not we, but like, uh, generally, it, it approach lets um, XDP program to get um, metadata directly from the Rx uh, descriptor. So, and the question, how do we do that? And uh, there was this suggestion that maybe we should like um, use uh, kernel functions in BPF because like uh, it's certainly a possibility. Um, there was also a suggestion to use uh, so and uh, how it would look is that uh, XDP program uh, assembles uh, metadata by itself by reading directly from the descriptor through like uh, driver calls. Um, and like uh, I think that advantages of this approach are pretty clear. We get only the metadata that we actually are interested in and we can very easily specify like a custom layout that like all our our bpf programs and afxdp programs use um so it's like even better if you have like um multiprog or afxdp because in that case you can have like this bpf program that only uh assembles metadata and so you can attach differently this like translator programs to different interfaces, but that your main BPF program that actually uses metadata, it's like the same on every interface. So, uh, so this uh, certainly does have uh, its advantages. Um, um, but this approach is actually from what i've seen it's like very complex and a lot of design questions have to be asked here so uh like to start with like do we want those helpers like to be to be named like uh, generically um, and resolved later or do we already want users to use like driver specific helpers um, what i mean by that like 
do you want your BPF pro this translator BPF program to look like um, just uh, a get RSS or like eyes get RSS and then you have like uh, different functions for XDP program that are for different drivers or do we want to like use program uh, the use the functions that are named the same for every driver and that let libbpf resolve it and that's a second question how do we want to resolve such generic uh, generically named um, functions because there is also like this topic was also brought up with uh, in Hin's discussions a lot like can we do libbpf reallocations uh like when with promise to later attach a zp program to a certain interface or when we attach in program to a certain interface um so and we, we would need to do the same uh if we want want the that generic helpers okay so and another design issue is whether we want to pass the ownership of rx descriptor to xdp program um like or do we want like a driver to dig through its stack to access the descriptor that current running um, XDP program is related to. So what I mean by that, like, do we want, so if we pass the ownership of the Eric's descriptor to XDP program, um, I guess that verifier won't allow that. And for a good reason, it sounds pretty unsafe to me, but maybe someone has a different opinion on that. Um, and uh, the second option that is also possible uh, is uh, we pass our XDP buffer to the, uh, to the, the to this driver helper and what it will do uh is just deduce the pointer uh to the rx descriptor from the pointer to the xdp buffer so it it's like kind of a walk around but uh but it should uh, it should really be possible uh by that like we also can deduce rx descriptor just from if index and q index but it would be like i guess it would introduce a severe like speed penalty and what's the point in such like custom metadata if we would uh, have such penalty um so we we really have to access rx descriptor like directly either from xdp program or by like digging through stack in a driver um so does such approach mean that we must totally drop uh uh hints to skb conversion like generally that this generic hints usage case but I really think that we do not have to. Those two approaches can really uh, coexist together. Like, I think that a case is that when generic hints can be more useful. And then there are also cases when we would like to assemble like a totally custom metadata. Okay, so that's all from me on that topic. Questions? So, um, just a 
enable it. Just a couple of comments. So I think in your design or any design that you will require or will add any uh, performance hit is, should not be acceptable, uh, namely the BPF helpers, because it's going to require an indirect call back to the driver or whatever helper going to introduce. So, uh, for example, getting the hash, you might be better off ca calculating the hash than doing an indirect call. That's one thing. And um, also in your design, you should accommodate for different architecture and, and uh, devices. So uh, in your design, you always uh, say that the metadata is in the RF descriptor and different hardware might have it in different place, like a completion queue or whatnot. So previously, like a couple of years ago, we discussed a proper design for this. And uh, we agreed that uh, uh, any future hardware should place the metadata that is enabled prior to the packet data that's the best approach that wouldn't hurt any performance yes but like i i just like we also for now we stick with like uh, data meta uh but like this uh k function helpers was brought up a lot on the like mailing lists lately so I, I felt just like address addressing it would be a good decision. Yeah, so like, at, yeah but uh, the indirect call and when uh, RIT boolean now is enabled, it's uh, gonna get like it's gonna introduce a very big hit in performance. Uh, a tiny comment for me that BP of helpers they uh, are being resolved to direct calls uh, during G all. PPF helpers, even if you're going to go back to the driver callback? I'm not sure. Uh, not if you want to yeah. go to the driver. So, uh, this is what I, yeah. Different story. Yeah. So, yeah, we should avoid that. And I, I think we already designed it in a way that where you use BTF and Corey to uh, reorganize the data to accommodate to the specific hardware. That should do the trick. That doesn't work for AFXDP programs, unfortunately. Oh, uh, you have to introduce PPF into user space and run, uh, resolve <laughs> that uh, PTF. Yeah, and Corey for x86. Why not? Elf. So yeah, that, those are my two comments. OK, so on the mailing list, there was also like a suggestion to like make this helpers in line and uh, access a Rex descriptor with inline code, but I feel like this this is like really unsafe. Uh, it's not. You know, have to make sure it's read only, and there are some specific like hardware vendor specific data that you do wanna expose. Yeah, so, the, yeah. So like some stuff is like in hardware registers that was also mentioned somewhere so again a future hardware decent hardware should copy the metadata that the, the xdp program will require into the packet header uh mm -hmm. prior to packet header and then in legacy hardware should, should copy the data yeah most of those issues are actually for the like not uh, foundational nicks not smart nicks because smart nick is smarter foundational should do the same i mean yeah but legacy hardware can copy and we will have to swallow the performance hit of the copy. That's how it works for now. Yeah, you know. So uh, I think the magic should come from the future hardware. We should all define how future hardware should deal with uh, metadata. Can I make a comment on that? So I think I talked to you about this at break time. Yes. Why? Why you not just have the hardware send you in the in the pre packet space? Yeah, it works for smart nicks, not for. So if you can do this on the eight hundred or the seven hundred. Cannot, right? Yes. All right. All right. Yeah, but are we discussing that here, or that has nothing to do with the XDP, right? It's generics. Anybody can use that. 
I'm saying it's not directly related to XDP, for example. It's related to the XDP hand design. Whatever we decide in the future. Right. So you'll have to have some way of annotating the metadata in the packet header. Like say, this is metadata one, three. I thought you were raising your hand. Eddie. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm frustrated with this topic. Same here. I think like the entire community is frustrated with this topic already. Frustration. It's. I, I guess the there's multiple solutions. No, or? I'm joking. Oh, okay, okay. Because all those issues they are like present for the entire lifetime of of the like hints idea. Now, okay. Um, if there are no more comments, I'd like to go forth. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, Alibaba here. I mean, we have uh, we have it, but. Uh, uh, we can't like invite him to the stage to speak. I just wanted to comment on that, that they are working on um, zero copy uh, FXDP for Vertio because currently uh, Vertio uses uh, generic FXDP and it's sort of zero copy because uh, uh, it can use uh, headless um skbs uh, by the previous part series it was merged uh, a year ago uh but zero copy like driver side uh fxdp for vertio is uh anyway is faster so they are working on that uh and uh, yeah there's not much to uh except for that vertio can be like reused on uh Lots of hardware and uh, enabling FXDP, uh, I mean, native uh, would give uh, benefit there as well. And uh, the last, probably the last topic for today, I maybe will touch a couple of uh, ideas on the last, but yeah, we have uh, Jean here on the call with some slides. Let me open it. It's related to uh, XDP redirect, not only to network interfaces, network devices. Uh, but to um, like pretty much any device that have like struck device pointer. Uh, yeah, let me share it. Shan, are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Can you Alex? me... Yeah. Hello. Yes, Hello. yes. We can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, well, okay. Uh, uh, one sec. Let me share it for, oh, okay, it's here. Uh, guys on the bridge, can you see the presentation? Because I get lost a bit. Uh, what is going on? Um, ah, okay, PowerPoint decided to share on uh, another screen. Cool, cool stuff. Okay, so you can start. 
Okay, okay, Bye thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, let me introduce my background. I'm from Intel uh, QET team. Uh, okay, QET is uh, the full name is a quick assist uh, technology. It's an um, ASIC uh, accelerator. Okay, that's uh, you can imagine uh, why I will raise this idea uh, to plug in the QET or other accelerators in the XDB pass. Um, uh, can I go to the next slide, Alex? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, it starts from the crypto case because the QET accelerator is capable about the crypto and the compression and the other overloading um, service. But the crypto is picked up uh, as the first uh, experiment in the XDB pass. And uh, um, as you know, uh, we have we have the LKCF in the Linux kernel. And we also have some user space solutions uh, in the for the crypto as well. Like uh, uh, we, sorry, we have the hyper LKCF for the first time. So uh, everyone can uh, okay, okay, LKCF is the Linux kernel uh, crypto framework. It's a standard uh, crypto framework. So so the, so so here I just pick the crypto as the first ex experiment. Uh, I would like to see that in the kernel we have the some crypto framework, and in the user space we can have some applications or some popular application to integrate the accelerators like the DBDK, and we already have it there. But uh, but there are still some limitations about the LKCF in the kernel. As you know, LKCF may, may be designed for, for, for different, uh, it provides a standard interface to, to, to different accelerators or, or CPU or specific uh, ISA. Mm, but uh, along with the development, the accelerator is developing and the accelerator can provide more and more features and uh, more strong strong and stronger uh, capability. But the LKCF can't accommodate them as much as possible. And uh, especially the, the legacy LKCF lies in the uh, uh, layer three, layer three. But XDB is, is just handling the native is not a frame, so so that's that's why we would like to to see the XDB can have the strength to to encrypt or to decrypt the the, the crypto data uh, from the wire. Mm, yeah, you know, we we all know XDB has a lot of a lot a lot of uh, quite a few user cases. The, the DDoS mitigation for warding or load balance, but all of them about the plain text. If we touch the encrypted data, XDB can do nothing. If we can decrypt the encrypted data at a, the um, very early stage, we can do more thing like the, 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 the DDoS mitigation and other or, or, or forwarding to other as a device, we can do more about that. Okay, uh, next, please. Okay, so 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 that's why we, we, we just try try to plug the QET the QT accelerator in the XDB pass. Uh, frankly, our original idea is to introduce a crypto map for the QET crypto service. But that may be too specific. So now we are trying to introduce a accelerator related map to, to, to adapt to various accelerators. Mm, as you can see in the slide, I'm not sure if it's too small. Uh, uh, usually the data, for, the data frame is received from the NIC and then the accelerator will program the pre-action and post-action BPF program into the XDB pass to analyze, to pass the, 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 the ethernet frame. And uh, if it's uh, 
some data met the criteria, it will be redirected to, to the accelerator. Here, uh, if we, for example, if it's a EPSEC, it's an ESB package, it could be redirected to the QAT for processing. And uh, after the decryption um, from the QAT, and uh, we, we can decide and we can have further further pass of the, of the decrypted data. Then we can decide the, the, the data can go to uh, kernel or go to user space or drop directly or redirect it to other device just uh, as a post action program implement, implementation. And uh, also uh, in this framework, we can syn synchronize uh, synergize uh, the, the accelerator's features um, with the uh, next next results because next have different uh, have different uh, queues and the accelerator also have its own queues we can have different combination and uh, tuning about uh, uh, how, how how they can work together uh, next slide please Okay, okay. This is a, a crypto map, a crypto map pipeline. Uh, how the QET is plugged in to to the XDB pass, and later it will extend it to the X, accelerator dev map. And uh, yeah, uh, we we uh, previously we introduced a crypto map here, and uh, if the pre pre crypto BPF function uh, judge. It met. It met. It met the criteria. It will be redirected to the QET in queue. We have the, the standard operation to the device in queue, and then similarly, it has DQ or or polling or interrupt mode. Then then we will get the data from accelerator uh, again, and we, we according to the um, action in the post crypto BPF program. We can do whatever we want. Uh, th then we can finish the overloading, overloading process. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, just as I see, uh, we see, we feel it's too specific to just uh, have the QET or have the QET crypto or compression. I uh, we we suppose we can abstract the accelerator dev map, something like that, in the XDB pass. That means we, we, we can have more functionality there. We, um, different uh, different company may have different accelerator. And also, as you know, Intel has uh, quite a few accelerators there, and they, they, they may plug in different accelerator and uh, according to their traffic and business. Mm, OK. Uh, can, can I go to the next? Okay. Uh, okay. Now we, we are drafting uh, a accelerator dev map interface. And our first uh, first option is to to introduce the accelerator dev map into the dev map hash. As we know, the dev map currently is just for the net dev, but we would like to extend its meaning of the dev map. The dev map could be, uh, could be uh, the net dev, and it could be also the accelerator dev. In the accelerator dev, we we we, we give, it, we just define different structure like BPF D tab accelerator dev. It, uh, we 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 are trying to abstract uh, the common operations and the common structures, common members for uh, that which can be uh, uh, applicable to all the accelerators. And uh, basically, the accelerator driver can register their ops into the accelerator dev map framework, do whatever they want. And also, we can uh, integrate the, uh, the key function. The key function can be implemented by the, uh, by the accelerator driver itself. And uh, the accelerator driver can define their own function. Uh, one purpose here is to decouple this framework and the accelerator as much as possible. That means this framework didn't uh, needed to know the the content 
of the accelerator. What does the accelerator do? Uh, and usually, accelerator may, may, may not want the framework to know what, what it will do. So it, the, this framework just pro, provides the, the structure and the ops to the accelerator driver. Uh, and accelerator driver can define its own acceler accelerator dev map value, which is opaque to the, firm, uh, the framework. Uh, yeah, and our first uh, trial e experiment will with the uh, QET crypto instance. Uh, uh, okay, okay, that, that, that's my our idea from for the accelerator dev. And um, do, do you have any question or, or suggestion about? So uh, what's the point of having this like inline instead of out of band, like using XFRM offload or TLS offload where you get the clear text uh, right away? No need to inject a packet back to the hardware. Uh, uh, for for example, in the in the uh, episec case, we, we will enqueue enqueue the, uh, the 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 encrypted data into into the accelerator, and uh, after the accelerator process it, we will get uh, the plain text. Yeah, but alternatively, you can just enable XFRM offload and uh, get get it for free. If Nick supports it, right? But the Nick supports it. You're injecting back to the accelerator, or accelerator is a different device. It's a different device. Yeah. So we, uh, this idea is uh, when uh, any like uh, when you need to pass a frame from your uh, Nick to uh, to any other like hardware or device to process it. For example. Um, if you want to uh, uh, not to decrypt frames, for example, in FXDP program, and you want to pass it uh, instead to uh, standalone uh, Cypher device and then get the plain text in the FXDP. I know that uh, many NICs nowadays, they have uh, crypto and stuff, but it may be used for any other uh, for some other uh, devices cases as well. So the idea is to enable it, provide some API. And uh, what's the completion model? How do you get back the notification about the completion of the acceleration? Jen? So, sorry, sorry, my network uh, is not well. I can't hear the question clearly. So yeah, the XDP program is running on the I'll ask again. So the XDP program is running on the network device where you trigger the acceleration device. And ev eventually, you'll need the packet to uh, be triggered back in the XDP device. So how does that work? Uh, OK. Uh, for the QET, for the QET um, extents, the, the QET will have some ops there. And after the the data have been processed, uh, it needed to go back to the XDB. It can go anywhere we want. For example, we can inject into the kernel stack or to the user space. Okay, so how do you get it back to the XDP program? It doesn't go back to the program. It's like how the, uh, for example, CPU map works. You have a, uh, another XDP program on uh, like output of your uh, compression cipher device, whatever. And this uh, second XDP program decides what to do next. So it's more like XDP redirect. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the second X, uh, PPF program will in the context of the accelerator execution, execution context. And uh, will there be a copy 
from the network buffer to that device no, buffer? No, no, no. We, we are trying to avoid that. We, 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 we are managing to reuse the, the buffer, the buffer from the, the NIC for, for the NQ, for the NQ side. And for the DQ side, the accelerator, accelerator can choose to allocate its own, own buffer before, because there is an NQ and DQ. In queue, we can reuse the buffer from Nick, and a DQ, we may use different buffer. That buffer can be a socket buffer or other kind of buffer. Yeah, this so we need to page cache. Do you have any performance numbers? Uh, not yet. It's ongoing now. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, maybe I can share share it later. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? We have some questions uh, in the chat. Uh, but if we need it back in XDP, what if original buffer contains several crypt? Ah, okay, so it's two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, but if we need it back in XDP, so it means that, that we need uh, the, the, the decrypted uh, or whatever frame in the first XDP program. Uh... So here, back in XDB means uh, in our designs, the it just uh, it will go through the second uh, the post action BPF program, and uh, and uh, in that context, after the process in the second BPF program, it uh, it can go uh, go 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 what what. what go to anywhere we, we want it to go. So it's not essential. It, it depends on the uh, requirement or, or, or the needs. Uh, the second question is, what if the original buffer contains several crypto frames? Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a question about scatter together or, or Uh, Sorry. One sec, I'll... Jamal, can you please add uh, Ivan to speakers? It would be easier and more What's, uh, fancy. Are you still hmm? oh, Sorry, what, uh, he's asking a question right now? Uh, yeah, he's asking in the chat, but he would like to join voice. So we need to add them to speakers. Yes. Right. So what? Oh man. Why? Can I do that? No. Uh, Yeah, I found him already. Okay, I can hand him the mic actually. He was actually sending a request. Okay. Why, why not? No, I stopped sharing. Uh, 
His question was about several crypto frames. What if original buffer contains several crypto frames? That's his uh, question. My, uh, yeah, my understanding is, uh, is a protocol relevant uh, for the ESP frame? And uh, no, normally they are, they are one by one. And uh, we, we just get a, we, we can pass the, the header, ESP header, and detect it. It's an IBSEC package. And we can send it to the accelerator. I think the, the question is probably something about TLS, since TLS requires multiple frames before you can encrypt or decrypt. OK, TLS, OK. Uh, TLS could be another another case here. So so you mean the a symmetric part or or the little symmetric part, a symmetric part or symmetric part? Because for the handshake, uh, okay, uh, for the TLS, uh, the handshake is, the protocol mainly lies in, in the user space, and uh, we have the the, the handshake there. And uh, there are also key kernel TLS there to do the symmetric uh, crypto part. And we can also overload the kernel TLS, KTLS part in, in, into this uh, idea. Ivan, uh, elaborate upon his questions. With crypto, it's often that a border between crypto frames may happen inside one buffer. TLS does that quite often. Yeah, I think that's a problem. Mm. I think I, I can think I, I can look into it a bit further about the TRS case. Yeah, we, we, we may discuss it later. You want to ask? Hi. Okay. I have one question for uh, for this design. So first question will be uh, which generation QET we caught talking about here? That's Crypto Creek or that's Lewisburg or you know? Mm, it's not relevant to the QT generation. It's I think that's relevant, because right? Because certain generations support inline, right? Mm, do you mean inline IPsec? Yes, potentially. Oh, I, I, I just wonder if that's possible. Uh, I just wonder, okay, if that's possible to offload the whole XDP program into the micro engine instead of doing this. Uh, but just some idea, purely idea, yeah. Yeah, QT. Okay, QT has two modes. One is the look side mode, and the other is inline epicycle sec mode. Inline sec, inline IP sec mode is another thing. There is a NAC a network. Uh, Accelerator com complex. All the data will will be processed by the hardware completely. Yeah, I just, I just say it's possible uh, mm -hmm. to in, even for local side in the yeah, post sure. cipher stage. If that's possible to offload the whole X XDP program into the Micro Engine, if that's possible, no, not, uh, not, not, no? not for now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe we. No, yeah, maybe we can. Engine, yeah, I know Micro Engine is quite capable to do that, right? Yeah, yes, yes. We can we, we have parser and we can analyze it. So we're out aware. of time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We're out of time, so let's wrap it. Um so yeah. Uh you can ask any time on a mailing list or whatever uh, regarding any of the topics that we brought, uh, any of the XDP uh, ideas, problems. Uh, yeah, that's it. That was the annual XDP workshop here at NetDev. Thanks for your attention.